studying wildlife requires patience. It requires diligence. It involves data collected and analyzed over long periods of time. It can be very challenging, and we're only able to see such a small glimpse into the lives of these transient and wild animals. When it comes to the complexities of these creatures, the more we learn, it seems, the less we know. Here at Brooks Camp, we have the privilege of living amongst a river that calls forth both humans and wildlife towards its abundant resources. Bears gather here in large numbers, and because of this opportunity, we're able to observe how they utilize the river, and we get an insight into the social structures of the bear hierarchy, we get to watch generations of storylines unfold, and we get to see many of the same bears return every year to the river to utilize it more. Hi, everybody. I'm Ranger Kim Grossman, and today we are joined by wildlife biologist, Ranger Leslie Scora. Leslie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So Leslie, you know, we live in an area where we get to watch these bears interact with each other and their environment. But as the landscape changes, so does the way the bears and the salmon also survive in the landscape. Um, they have to adapt. So with the bear monitoring program, it provides vital data to the shifts we are seeing um, amongst the Katmai brown bears, the river itself, and the changes to the ecosystem. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper into how the rangers on your team are collecting the data and um, what you all are finding out there, shall we? Sure, sounds yeah. good. <laughs> cool. So um, to get us started, uh, let's chat a little bit about what do you do on a daily basis here in Brooks Camp? Um, yeah. Um, so yes, I now oversee the bear monitoring uh, project along Brooks River um, and we have uh, another um, technician who's been collecting the data now for several years and um, the, the bear monitoring project started um, being regularly collected since around the year 2000-2001 and since then it's regularly occurred. Um, and that involves uh, a person being rotating through different locations along Brooks River. So being at Brooks Falls, um, being uh, here at the Lower River, and then there's a spot uh, in between the two um, that, uh, that will cycle through. And during a shift, uh, the observer is going to record uh, the number of bears uh, present along the river every 10 minutes, and then try to identify those ind individual bears just using the bear's physical features and behavioral characteristics, um, taking photos of that bear, uh, writing down some of these features such as ear color, um, muzzle shape and size, um, some of the scarring, uh, coat color, um, and and trying to get a, just a general age classification, so whether or not it's a younger bear, a subadult bear, or an older bear, or um, or even a cub. Um, and then at the end of each season, we'll compile the number of individual bears that have been regularly seen uh, along Brooks River. So that's seen at least uh, during three or more of those monitoring shifts. Mm -hmm. And then those bears are assigned a three-digit identification number that we try to keep with that bear um, season after season and year after year. Um, and that really provides some a great way to explore how bears are using Brooks River from year to year um, and how often, how frequently they're returning or not returning. Um, and and I've then been able to incorporate that into some research to look at survival and, and just yeah, in general stream use of at Brooks River by, by brown bears. Um, but it can be used for a great many different things too. Just yeah, looking at bear use, bear behavior uh, and human use and, and behavior along Brooks River as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of usage that goes into this, and <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of work that goes into identifying bears. Um, I know for me, I still have trouble identifying some of the bears, and as so do so many people out there as me well. Too. Me too. Yep. <laughs> like, does it ever get easier for you? <laughs> no, no, it does not. I mean, you you end up having a, a nice a set of bears that you're you're pretty confident in, but then especially these days when you have so many younger sub-adult bears and cubs um, visiting Brooks River, using Brooks River, um, it's it can be so hard to, cha to to keep track of them. And then as soon as you think you know that bear, it's going to go away for the month <laughs> of August and come yeah. back uh, 200 pounds heavier with a brand new coat um, <laughs> and, and look completely different. So yes, I I still struggle with, um, with bear identification. And now that I'm not regularly collecting the data, um, my, my abilities to identify the bears have, um, have 
yeah, kind of fallen by the wayside, but it's fun that I, I was part of that data collection and that makes it really exciting to, to work with the data and, and see what uh, interesting questions we can answer with it. Absolutely. And that makes me feel so much better to hear that you also struggle with that as well, because they do. They've been changing a lot, the bears out here. They've been getting their darker coats and I haven't been able to see a lot of their scars recently because their coats are starting to get thicker. So, you know, some of those identifying marks, it's just a little bit more difficult now. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that bears receive numbers when they're seen utilizing the river um, three times. Um, what if a bear receives a number and just doesn't come back eventually? What happens to that number? Um, eventually, if so each year we try to keep it in a different, the, any new uh, bears needing numbers in a different hundreds section. Um, and therefore, when we come cycle back to the, you know, whatever uh, year it is that that bear was numbered, if we need to reuse, if a bear hasn't been seen for at least five years, we may mm -hmm. recycle that number. Um, but um, otherwise, there's a chance a bear could return. Um, we may not be able to recognize it if it's been gone for five years, especially if it was a young bear and then shows up you know, five, seven years later yeah. and it's an adult and uh, looking much different. Um, but we do our best, and that's uh, you know all part of the the fun process here of of you know trying to track these bears, but not using tagging or collaring um, more invasive techniques. So. Yeah. So I mean, thinking about the idea of collaring and um, invasive techniques or just other ways that we may identify bears. We don't use names for the bears. We use numbers. Um, can you explain to the audience a little bit more about why we do that? Um, so the the numbers are. are just part of a, a good process. Three digits can fit really nicely on a data sheet, um, whereas coming up with, with nicknames for all the bears, although it's when you're watching bears, it is, or any anything, anything is part of your life, it's easy to come up with a nickname for it. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, just to have a, a reliable way to track and monitor individual bears um, came up with a three digit numbering system. Um, but yeah, I know as, as people have been watching, you know, in the, with the bear cams, uh, it's, it's easy to, to come up with your own nicknames for the bears. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I know, I know that I've heard a lot of different uh, nicknames for 164 out there, the one that likes to sit right beneath the waterfall. <laughs> a lot of different nicknames for him. I've, I've heard people, you know, refer to him as taking a shower. <laughs> um, so I, we did actually have um, a, a viewer question earlier um, this week and they were asking about the numbering system and would we ever, um, step aside from using a number that may have a stigma attached to it um i mean i could i could see perhaps <laughs> not using a number uh retiring a number for me perhaps a beloved bear but that's just my own personal um <laughs> uh you know connection with with individual bears um but uh, I, I guess I haven't encountered that yet. Um, sometimes we may skip a few numbers if, if yeah, a bear has been seen uh, within five years, so we may skip it and give it a little space in between um, and try to you know, put maybe siblings having numbers uh, that are, are close enough together so you can maybe like make it just a little bit easier to track and follow. But it's all sort of a part of what numbers are available and um, for, for that year and how many bears you, uh, you have to number that year. That is good to know. Thank, thank you for <laughs> explaining that thoroughly for us all. Cause I know we've all been wondering a little bit, how does this bear get its number? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 The, the observer can have a little bit of, of play with, uh, you know, perhaps, um, you're trying to align something, making it a little bit easier to, to remember in the future. But for the most part, it's just whatever number's available. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a bear that has not been named yet this year, but there's been rumors going around about what this bear's number may be <laughs> this winter when she gets named. So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll stay tuned yeah, for that. Exactly. <laughs> um, so um, this monitoring program, um, it's been around for many years, um, back when the older bridge existed. Um, has this affected any of the monitoring protocols or affected the bears in the way that they interact around this area? Um, well, we did a, a separate monitoring project when the, uh, the bridge was installed, just to look at what sort of human activities, um, behaviors, noise, movement, um, might be impacting the bears and um, you know, differences in, in bear use of this area, depending on either that bear's age or sex and if it may be avoiding more mm -hmm. um, closer to the bridge or not. Um, and we haven't finished um, analyzing that data set yet. Um, however, just in, in the preliminary results, we're finding that yet yeah, it's like sudden 
loud noises tend to have uh, a greater impact on bears that were, um, you know, that are close to the bridge. And so we try to um, make sure that, like, we, we promote good uh, bear viewing behavior for people that are using the platforms and just our own use of the bridge. If you know you're having to to try to move gear across, making sure that we're we're doing it in a, a manner that's um, causes the least amount of disturbance to the bears in the area. Absolutely. Um, just to, to let everybody in out there that's tuning in um, and something today's a little bit quieter of a day. It is raining out here um, on the platform. And before we start the broadcast, we were able to see some otters down on mm -hmm. the river. So it does appear that our wildlife may be more active, you know, when we're respecting their space and we're a little bit quieter. So yeah, definitely, definitely good to note that. <laughs> um, so we have seen a lot of bears utilizing the river this year compared to years past. Like a lot of them have stayed. Um, you know, how has Katmai's bear population changed over time? And are we seeing any trends between the bear population and the fish migration, the, the um, escapement numbers? Um, so it's to get, um, oh, I do think we might have some wildlife below us on the platform. I heard some rustling. <laughs> um, uh, however, though, uh, so monitoring the the actual population of the bears in this uh, in, in Katmai and the region is is very tricky. Um, so what we're getting a glimpse at with this the bear monitoring data set along Brooks River is is more use of this river. And so what um, we found is that when there are more salmon, there tend to be more bears that come and use the river, particularly sows with cubs. Um, as for adult bears, in particular all, uh, adult male bear bears, there's a little bit of a lag. So as um, salmon abundance increases or escapement increases in the river, um, we'll see like a couple years later, um, the, then the adult bear use of this river um, will, will increase with that. And then similarly, when escapement is decreasing, um, it, it, there'll be a couple years where, you know, perhaps these uh, individual bears still come see how, um, how the salmon, how abundant it, they are. And then if it's not really proving worth their while, if the comp competition is too high, then they may go um, and, and try a different area. And, um, Bear, brown bears have such huge home ranges. I mean, they don't need to here. There's really abundant food sources, but they can go hundreds of miles in a short period of time. Um, so just because we have uh, a lower escapement at Brooks River um, in a particular year or period of time doesn't mean it's necessarily affecting the population. The bears could just be moving around um, using other resources or other salmon streams where um, salmon are more abundant. So. It makes things very tricky, and as you said when you started um, the, this uh, talk, that like basically the the more we realize we don't know, by digging deeper, you realize you you, know, you just want to know more. So that's yeah. one of those uh, fun things that um, that I've discovered in trying to to play around with this monitoring data. Is there's so much more to know. There's so much. <laughs> they're they're bears. They're everywhere out there, and we're just wondering what they're doing. Yep. <laughs> um, so. Uh, how do we see um, the bear monitoring program in general? You know, how does it help assist uh, National Park Service's goals? And like, how are we helping protect these bears through the bear monitoring program? Um, so it, it's a, yeah, a great way to track uh, bear behavior and use of the river along with um, human use and to how uh, it track any, if there's, um, I guess, a dynamic there of, are we seeing increased human use with uh, decreased bear use or not? Um, you know, it's, but it's also really hard to tease apart that. If there's abundant salmon, bears are willing to tolerate both each other and humans um, in much closer proximity. So, um, but it, it does serve to just monitor those use trends for both bears and people. Um, and uh, the past several years, I've been working on a master's project using this um, bear monitoring data. And because we're able to identify individual bears year after year, I use that um, to estimate bear survival um, along Brooks River. And so, yeah, we didn't need to do uh, tagging or collaring. And because we've had, you know, over 20 years of bear monitoring data collection, um, it was a great long-term look at, at what survival has, um, has been like. And, um, with that analysis found that for the most part, sub-adult and adult bear survival had stayed pretty consistent through time. Um, there was, uh, looking at cub survival, um, it looked like a little bit of a, a dip, um, when escapement was lower, but since fewer sows with cubs tend to uh, use Brooks River when escapement is lower, it meant there was a smaller sample size. So you couldn't specifically say, 
yes, yeah, survival cub survival was lower <laughs> when escapement was lower along Brooks River, but um, hopefully more uh, more data, more analysis will will help uh, tease out the that answer. So. Um, so it, it, yeah, the monitoring data is, is a great long-term look that um, you often don't get when you have to when you use tagging or collaring um, techniques, just because you end up getting a much shorter uh, mm. short-term look at, at bears, especially if you're doing collaring, having to recollar a bear year after year. Um, so by using just our ability to identify individual bears, we're able to to keep. Um, keep a, a longer record which is pretty amazing that is amazing i like that yeah okay. <laughs> for ob observing bears <laughs> um so you had mentioned um that some of these smaller family groups you know they, they venture off so it's hard for us to be able to observe them during this time because we don't know where they are but um we do know that they kind of venture out maybe to other locations what what are they looking for um just a mosquito flying my face um <laughs> <Wildlife>. <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, so we have been able to identify some of the bears of Brooks River using um, nearby stream, salmon streams, uh, including like Margot Creek um, and Ida Vane and, and like American Creek. So they are, they're taking advantage of um, salmon streams that have just a different run timing um, in that area. Um, but bears are also taking advantage of the, the berries that are coming uh, mm -hmm. into into good productivity at this time um and and just any other food resources they can have uh, get their paws on basically <laughs> yeah i've seen i've seen a lot of scat recently that was very colorful yes <laughs> yeah yes. it's interesting it's always interesting to know what they're eating and that's a good indicator yeah <laughs> of their diet um so well as part of like you know seeing these other places that bears travel to we know you do a lot of aerial surveys to observe the bears which is really cool um so we do concentrate a lot you know on brooks river um but there are so many hours put into researching these bears um through sky observations <laughs> um and one place that we send many of our rangers to every year is uh the crosswind area of the park and i think you just you just came from a trip over there and i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about like what it was like and what kind of observations of bears you were seeing of that location mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the monitoring that we do at, at Crosswinds, it's in the Katmai Preserve area, and we usually go in August because um, that's when um, bear use of that area is high and, and then human use of the area increases as well. Um, and so yeah, it's a, it's a place where we can actually get people on the ground similar to, to here at Brooks Camp, although you know there's fewer amenities there. Um, but we're doing a similar um, data collection to the Brooks River bear monitoring, only we're not able to identify individual bears season after season since they're only there for um, at most two weeks uh, out, of, out of in August, basically. Um, but we're still trying to get an idea of the, the number of bears using um, the Moraine and Funnel Creek, um, their behavior, and um, just basically, yeah, just the, the proportion of sows with cubs in that area. Um, and so often it's similar spending uh, several hours uh, sitting on the tundra and, and watching bears. So it's, uh, it can be a pretty, a pretty good experience when the weather is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw some, um, some images of um, the rangers time there while they were observing and it looks like the, the bears uh, interact with humans a little bit differently than they do here. So yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's a much more open yeah. uh, tundra landscape. Um, so yeah, bears are able to, um, choose whether or not they want to approach a group of people, whereas when we're in this more forest environment, um, you you, tend, you don't always know when and where there are going to be bears that, that pop up around corners and, and behind trees and stuff. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, an interesting dynamic out there. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so other than Brooks Camp, and Crosswinds, which we know are like two very popular places for you all to go see bears at. Um, your team also monitors bears um, and other locations of the park, including a lot of, uh, you know, again, these aerial surveys and looking over at different streams and creeks. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, more about what some of these locations are like and what are we seeing in those bears and maybe their behaviors? Are they similar to the Crosswinds bears? <laughs> right. Um, so because there are very few roads within Katmai and it can be really difficult to access um, much of the park, um, yeah, we take advantage of airplanes and being able to count bears while they're congregating on salmon streams, um, just because it's, it's often open so you can see bears uh, 
easier than if they were uh, just scattered across the landscape like they would be in the spring um, or, or fall when they're yet yeah, when they're not on salmon streams. So we take advantage of, of this time period when bears are along salmon streams and um, as we we're kind of talking earlier, uh, different streams have different timings for when the salmon are, are running through, migrating through, and actually spawning. Um, so we try to identify when the peak uh, bear use and, and salmon spawn timing is for these streams and then um, collect a count of bears uh, along that salmon spawning stream. And we, um, there's, the, these surveys have started in the 1970s. Um, they, are a little sporadic across decades, um, but have been pretty regularly occurring since 2013. And so we're trying to keep, um, build that data set um, so that we can look at, start to look at trends in bear use uh, of salmon streams across um, both Katmai the park and the preserve, and even trying to incorporate Antioch Czech uh, National Monument and Preserve in there. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's, once again, a uh, different, uh, you know, a, a, a bigger picture uh, as opposed to just the, the Brooks River um, side of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned a little bit about that aerial survey or surveys over the pre uh, preserve area. Um, we know that there was a survey done earlier this year. Can you give us a little sneak preview of what you found in the data? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, earlier this year, we actually did um, what's called, uh, well, it was, it was uh, a density estimate of brown bears within the Katmai Preserve. And so this, we, we do it in the spring when the bears are scattered across the landscape and they're not just congregating. And it gives us an idea of the actual, yeah, the population of bears lives and resides within Katmai. So not just bears from outside that are coming in to use the salmon resource while they're here and then dispersing across again. Um, and so we had two airplanes doing these surveys, um, kind of simultaneously communicating with each other so we knew um, where, where each other were. And um, we had set um, that what are called transects or basically routes that we were going to fly. And when we saw a bear, we would, um, you know, mark where we saw it and go fly over that bear and, and figure out the distance uh, that that bear was away from that, that line we were flying. Um, and so then we're going to try to use that to um, estimate the number of bears that we missed during the survey, but we're actually there and present. Um, and that's what, that's going to give us, yeah, an actual like density of bears in, uh, within that preserve. And the last time that was done, um, there was an unpublished study in 2009. Um, there was a published study in 2000, I believe like six around there of, of both the preserve and, um, and Katmai National Park. And then I think even previously before it was in the year 2000. So it's much harder to do those types of surveys, but it's a good look at yeah, how the population uh, of bears is, is fluctuating. Um, so we don't have an estimate yet for, for this year, um, but uh, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> how, how, how are you able to see the bears, like, you know, while you're flying over doing these surveys? Are they just like small little dots on the landscape? <laughs> just curious um, about that. So it, it is low level flying. We're anywhere from 200 to 500 feet above ground level. Um, so it, it takes specially trained pilots and gear um, to in order to, to fly these surveys. Um, but Real quick, Leslie. I think we may have um, lost the audio on here. Hey, are we coming in okay? Can you hear us okay? Excited about 
den, bear den. Mm -hmm. And so while you're doing these aerial surveys, can you can you see any bear dens or like do we know much about like locations of where bears are making their winter homes? Um, we so there in years past there has been uh, a couple of bear den studies. It was um, and basically they were trying to figure out if they could try to uh, do surveys and count bear dens and use that as an es a way to estimate uh, estimate the bear population because uh, in theory for every bear there is a den um, yeah. and um, there was some success in that um, there needs to be a bit more research on how long a den will last so if you see a den during a survey is that necessarily this past winter's den or is it a den from uh, a few years ago so there's uh, you know, a bit more work to do but that is another um, a very interesting way that we can try to estimate uh, bear population um, yeah, without having to use tagging and collaring. Um, and way back when, in the, the 1970s, there were some collaring of uh, bears around in this area, and um, that there, there were several bears that ended up losing their collars, and um, you know, not a, a ton of information was gained at it. But from that, we did find that uh, many of the bears in this area were making dens either on dumpling or pecan at and, and the mountains nearby so um with that we know that yeah many bears just choose to stay in this area and you know it may just be that because uh, there's such an abundance of, of food and different food resources that they don't need to travel very far they can just stay stay put yeah why would they travel <laughs> <laughs> with everything that they need or want is here <laughs> um <laughs> kind of a, kind of a silly question because we also look at one to a grazer and her two cubs here and they're so large <laughs> so as you were seeing these different dens were you seeing like them vary in size um i, I have not done the den survey um, but in the den that i have seen yeah they do there are some large small there's some that you kind of wonder um you know did that maps or like what was that they're thinking mm. but um <laughs> Who am I to judge? I've never dug a den. So. Me neither. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, so, all right. Well, thank you for sharing that about the day. <laughs> because we've, we've all been wondering. <laughs> um, so, you've been working on your PhD thesis. Um, and I was wondering if we could dive a little bit more into that. You could tell us about what you've been looking into, what it is that you're trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah, you study. Um, that sounds fun with a plan. Um, so, I guess just to. to Backtrack up a bit. So yeah, for the past several years, I had been working on my master's, and that was using the bear monitoring data of Brooks River and trying to estimate survival and abundance and how that's changed through time. Um, and yeah, with that, saw that uh, you know, abundance had been changing, and that there were some relationships between uh, bear use and the salmon statement, um, and that for the most part, survival didn't change a whole lot, um, but perhaps there there were some changes with cub survival. Um, and then with the, the PhD, it's sort of a, a, a broader look, and it's focusing on using that aerial survey data and looking at bear stream use throughout Katmai and these streams that we've regularly um, surveyed year after year. Um, and, and yeah, trying to, to create an abundance estimate with those counts, trying to um, uh, come up with an estimate of maybe the number of bears that we don't see but are actually there, mm -hmm. and um, and then you know, what uh, what bears were, were perhaps in the, the area, but we didn't actually count. Um, so yeah, trying to use unmarked bears to estimate abundance once again, and then also then trying to incorporate these density estimates that have just kind of periodically um, occurred throughout um, in, in Katmai, just because they're more difficult. Um, but using um, those uh, those periods in time to look at, okay, if that's what the actual population is doing, and then we have these stream surveys, um, which show bare uh, stream use, but not necessarily actual population use, um, just kind of trying to tease apart what's the difference in stream use versus what's the difference in change in population. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of computer models involved, uh, a lot of yeah, trying to figure out based on the number of bears estimated last year, what could be the number of bears that survived or, or, or died uh, this year, and then what might the future hold. Um, and also just yeah, trying to incorporate some of that, uh, the Brooks River bear survival data to kind of inform these models that are predicting um, how the, the bear abundance or use experience has changed through time. And, It'd be nice if we could go all the way back to the 1970s and, and come up with a, a trend map as to how bear use has changed through the years, but it may, it may just 
I'm going to start small and, and see how far <laughs> I can go. Um, do you have any other like special tools that you're able to use to, to look at this data or to gather new data? Um, so a lot of it is uh, computer models and standing on the shoulders of a great biologist before me who have, have come up and written books and I'm trying to learn uh, as much as I can from um, from folks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's using the aerial surveys that you know, were set up in the 70s and using those protocols, but trying to figure out ways that I can incorporate some more information without changing how we collected that information. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, as computers have been getting more and more powerful, the software that we can, uh, you know, run and use to run these models uh, has, it's incredible. It's opened up some new worlds to how we, we look and analyze um, account data and can model and, and do a whole variety of work with wildlife. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So, so, all right, so with the advancement in technology, we're going to get some really incredible findings okay. along with all your research. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, so another thing is I know a lot of people would like to, to, you know, read further into everything that you've been researching and doing. And so we were asked, is your thesis available somewhere for everybody to read? It, um, it, should, it is available through uh, the Michigan State University um, webpage. I think you will have to do a bit of searching. I would need to map it out as to where it is. I am hoping to publish a few articles from that thesis that are a bit more uh, are easier to digest because the thesis is uh, a long, wordy version uh, to please the, the academics. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, hopefully can we'll, we'll in the, the next year or so come out with um, some some sort of manageable um, snapshots of, of that work. But for anybody who does want to um, go take a, a, a look at the long version and at least some of the, the tables and figures, um, yeah, it should be available on the, um, the Michigan State University website. I think you can either search my name or um, oh, try to think of the, the title <laughs> that I had, um, but I think it was like estimating um, brown bear survival and abundance uh, in along Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. So. All right, so they, River, me. they search <laughs> Leslie Flora and brown bears. They'll probably be able to find you. <laughs> yeah. And if, if, if anybody's reading it and they're like, wow, I really would like to see more digestible, we'll just have everybody ask for Leslie Flora to come back on and talk with us again. <laughs> and we'll ask you some more questions. <laughs> and I need to, yeah, also just find the time to write. It's easy to, <laughs> it's easy to, to want to be outside and counting bears and watching bears. Um, but the, it's a good thing that bears hibernate in the winter because then it gives me a chance to go um, try to analyze some, some information and, and try to do some writing. So it's yeah. a good opportunity. A, a nice split between being out in the field and doing the, yeah, a little the analyzation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you do some very interesting work. We just have a couple more questions for you um, before we turn it over to the audience. Um, and so I was wondering, are there any other projects that you all are working on um, out here in the park this summer or just ongoing projects in general? Um, yes, there are. Uh, so lo and behold, there are other wildlife species yeah. um, besides brown bears in, in Katmai. Um, so, uh, but once again, um, aerial surveys provide a, a great opportunity and great way to access different areas of the park. So we, we use that resource um, whenever possible. Um, so we also do um, aerial surveys to estimate trends in moose uh, abundance. Um, and for the past two years, we've been trying to get a minimum count of caribou that are within the Katmai Preserve. Um, there's kind of this pocket of caribou that um, you know, may be part of the, the greater Malchatna herd um, it, within the, the Alaska Peninsula. Um, but uh, for some reason, they, they may or may not be joining up with the rest of the herd. So it's just um, in, good to know whether they're where they are and how many there, there may be. Um, and let's see, the moose, caribou, we do uh, bears, of course. Um, we also count bears as they're congregating on sedge meadows along the coast, just another good opportunity where we know there are likely going to be bears and they're going to probably be easier to spot because they're in an open meadow. Um, and then the past two years, we've also done a uh, ptarmigan, um, actually a density estimate for ptarmigan. Um, so we'll hope, be hoping to wrap that project up this winter. Um, but that was actually um, getting feet on the ground and uh, dropping people off to different locations uh, along the park, the preserve and in an Aniac Shack. Um, and, and sort of instead of flying a, a, a line or a transect, uh, somebody walking it and, and then estimating or whenever they see a ptarmigan, 
um, measuring the distance from, from that transect. So um, hopefully we'll be able to, to look at that. And um, those were, uh, it was a project that the um, Fish and Wildlife Service in the, the Bespera Refuge had used in years past. And so um, we were able to, to share, they, were, they shared their techniques with us. And so it'll be a good opportunity to be able to monitor the trend in, in timing and abundance along the peninsula and kind of fill in some of the gaps if uh, you know, we do a few years and then they can do a few years. And um, so yeah, it's a good opportunity to share knowledge. Absolutely. Wow, I didn't realize so, there was such an intensive um, karmic experience <laughs> happening in the park currently. So thank you for sharing that with us. So for our last question for you, we're going to turn it back to bears. <laughs> and just curious, what are some of your most pressing bear questions? Just, you know, again, there's so little that we know about bears and there are so many things that I, I question, you know, and after talking to some people in the forums, I know that they, in the afternoon sometimes, think of these wild questions themselves. <laughs> what, what's just one thing or two things that you're just hoping one day we can find the answer to <laughs> about bears? Oh my goodness. Yeah, there are many things. Um, but I'd probably have to go toward the, the work I'm doing with my PhD if I'm going to dedicate four years of my life to trying and answer a question. Um, that's, yeah, what I feel like is pretty pressing. And that's, yeah, basically trying to figure out how the bear population has, has been changing through time. And if we can then look at how factors such as salmon escapement influence that and, you know, perhaps then start incorporating other environmental factors, you know, maybe some either winter severity or berry productivity, um, that would be really great. And then we could um, almost then start to predict in the future of, of you know, if, if there are changes in the environment, how might that impact uh, bear abundance and bear use and, and bear population within Katmai. So that would be delightful, but uh, one step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And we look forward to, you know, seeing everything that you, you put together from all this research. It's Me wonderful. Too. I look forward to seeing, <laughs> to seeing it someday. <laughs> so um, that's all I've got for you today, but we wanted to turn it over to our audience and um, hear some of your most pressing questions. We've, we've got wildlife biologist Leslie Squirt with us. So let's see what, um, what everybody has on their mind. And I'm going to read this to you, but I'm going to come up to the camera. I'm going to be like the bears on the webcam, you know, when I start sniffing it. Um, how does one become a bear monitor? Um, ooh, wow, that is, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I applied um, for a, um, a biological science technician position in 2013, and it's through um, the, the website USA Jobs. So they, they do um, a hiring for most of the National Park Service. And there were you kind of by location in parks, so you could check um, check which park you wanted to check. I knew of Katmai, but I had no idea uh, of the research that was going on there. And um, you know, after there's you know some vetting through HR, and then eventually the the biologist at the time um, saw my resume and asked me for an interview. And um, I had previous bear experience and work in, experience in Alaska. Um, but uh, it, so it, it seemed like a good fit uh, for both uh, the biologist at the time and myself. Um, and yeah, it basically they just had this, this vacant position. And once I arrived, there was a lot of time um, spent looking at past photos of bears um, mm -hmm. through the years, uh, you know, definitely like either hard drive photos and, and actual printed out photos, um, working with people who had either that previously worked with the bear monitoring position or, or had done bear monitoring in the past um, to help me learn the individual bears um, and yeah, other previous rangers who had experience. So a lot of time went into yeah, being able to identify individuals and then taking photos of the current bears using the river and um, and then trying to identify and match them up. It's almost like a fun like matching game. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of time spent doing that, and then just work, uh, you know, like maintaining data sets, entering data of every time. You know, we're writing this on on paper, right in the rain paper, because uh, it does have to rain while you're outside sometimes. Um, so yeah, then uh, you know, there's there's work that goes into to making paper copies and, and putting it into spreadsheets and uh, um, and yeah, organizing data. So yeah, I, I, I'm going back to that you. 
there's a lot of work that goes into being able to identify these bears. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, when you were talking about it, I imagine you making those little flashcards, you know, where you have to like match the bear with its name. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So wonderful. Yeah, thank you for talking about the bears with us. Um, let's see, what bear has been your biggest ID oh challenge? Um, well, I don't know, I can't put it individual this time, since I, so in 2017, I stepped into the, the wildlife biologist role, and um, it's it's been a great experience in being able to start to answer questions with using this data set, but it does mean I spend uh, a less amount of time out here actually being able to, to ID bears. So nowadays, so many of the sub-adults for me are just really hard to, to ID because um, they're they're new, they're changing, they're growing, they're hanging out in you know gangs and gaggles for a while, and then they split off, and then you see them on their own. And um, so right now, sub adults, I am just not very good at IDing the sub adults, unfortunately. So I have to rely on the, the current care monitor to uh, sure. <laughs> to tell me. I understand, and then right, because sub adults, you know, they're bears that are still learning; they're in their teenage years, so their behaviors are just sporadic <laughs> so you know as they're changing physically we can't also rely on these like different dispositions or behaviors that because they're testing everything out so yep. same, same as you same. Uh, i have yep. a hard time identifying the sub-adults as well <laughs> and they may not yet have any big scars because the other they're not uh getting into big fights they don't have the life history that uh, a lot of the dominant male bears of at brooks falls do so you know you can't can't really as much on that uh, missing ear or something quite yet so. <laughs> Good, yeah, and hopefully it stays that way for many of them. <laughs> um, what what do we have next? Um, how many new unidentified bears have been spotted so far this year? Oh, I am not sure. Uh, that would be a good question for the, the current bear monitor. Um, but um, I know we, we have at least, it sounded like we were close to identifying 100 individual bears for the July season. Um, but uh, there's still a lot that goes on with seeing, you know, a bear that you saw a couple days is the same bear you see five days later. Um, so I know she's working real hard to, to start to, I guess, clean up that information. And, you know, probably by the, uh, the end of the season, you know, maybe in September, October, we'll be able to, to have some of those numbers. Okay. So um, then on this question, how many bears last year did we have identified? Ooh, I remember. do not have that number. Okay. <laughs> the problem is that we're pretty close to 100 uh, individuals um, that were that were identified uh, that, as regular users of Brooks River. So it's it's looking like we're on the same, either the same or a little bit uh, more, a few more bears um, identified than last year. And I forgot if you mentioned, do we do we consider all the bears? Do we identify them all, no matter what their age range is? Um, so we do just number um, independent bears. So if they're, they're cubs that they're still with uh, their mom, they're not going to get a number and we'll keep track of the total number of you know, spring cubs and yearlings and, and, and dependent two-year-old bears. Um, but the, the bears that we identify in, in total count uh, the number of individual bears when we say that. Um, they're just going to be independent bears. Uh, so not with their mom. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> And the next question, we're going to move this out of the way. Hi. Um, have you seen 909 and 910 together with their cubs? If so, what do you make of their interaction? Do you think it's possible that the four of them will den together this year? Um, well, uh, you know, that is a good question for the, the bear monitoring position. Um, they have been spending time together, um, but it'd be very cool to follow them again and see what they do, uh, or at least follow to see where they go this winter. Um, but yeah, I don't, um, they they could go together, but I, I feel like they're likely going to gonna be separate. Um, but yeah, for now, they're comfortable with each other and they're comfortable hanging out with each other, so they're uh, they're doing their thing. <laughs> yeah. Have, have we ever seen anything like that before where um, two independent grown uh, bears den together? Um, we haven't since we don't do, uh, aren't able to track the bears in, uh, where they go. Like that is one of the benefits of a collaring project um, is that you can see actually where where bears are going 
um, when you're not at Brooks River and, and when they're going to Benning or yeah, where, they're, where they are right now in August or in the spring. Um, so there's, yeah, there's definitely benefits to that. I um, mean, that's sort of, that's where the areas are so really lacking uh, of, of where, do, where do the bears go and where do they den and are they denning with other bears? Yeah. I would love to know that question. <laughs> that would be a good question. <laughs> All right, so what is the difference between uh, tagging and collaring? Um, so tagging um, usually refers to actually having like a little um, tag or like a piece of plastic that may have a number on it. Um, and so I, it could be oftentimes it would be on, like on a bear's ear. Um, and that just would, it allows for the ability to identify like that individual and you wouldn't have to know all of the physical and behavior characteristics. There wouldn't be that question of what somebody else is that if that individual had uh, a tag on it. And sometimes the tag could be a collar and it just has a number on it. It doesn't mean that there's a, any radio collar on it or a GPS unit with it. It's just that it's a visible marker and it may have a number that you can read that number and know which individual that is. Um, but then when I refer to collaring, I usually, uh, when I said, said that earlier, I was referring to either uh, radio collaring or GPS collaring, which um, would give us information on location um, and, and that individual. But yeah, you can either need to have data sent uh, to the computer saying, okay, this is that individual, here's where it's been going the you know, past months, several months. Um, or if it's a, a radio collar, then uh, there's a certain frequency you have to uh, basically go out trying to search for the, that frequency, seeing if the bear is nearby and what direction that frequency is in. Um, so that's so collaring give a, a better idea of location, um, and whereas tagging is just better able to um, identify an individual, but you can know its location if you see it, because then it is in your location. <laughs> so so one's more technolo technology based, we're able to track them, and the other one's more we just know who it is. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit more simple to do uh, tagging. Uh, well, a little bit more simplistic, I would say. You still have to put a tag on there, so it's, it's still very complicated. Yeah. Can I can I ask? Can I add on to this question? How do you like how how do people tag this? Um, so yeah, it it would require some um, to train to start and to date a bear, and then yeah, it would be either to, to put an ear tag on or a radio collar. Um, we then have to monitor that bear as it recovers um, from the chemical immobilization. Mm. Um, so we haven't done that, especially in the Bukhuza area, because there's, it's just a, a densely populated um, area for bears, and there's the opportunity that a bear could um, basically see if there's the food opportunity um, of, of another bear that's been sedated. So um, we haven't done it, plus, um, you know, it's, it's a it's a national park and deciding to, to keep the bears from being tagged or collared. It's, um, you know, it's a debate. There's a really great amount of information that can be learned from tagging and collaring, um, but it is invasive. So it's, there's, there's that difference that we have between um, between the project. So our bears at Brooks are all natural. Currently, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is the population of brown bears on Brooks River near carrying capacity? How many bears can the rivers hold? Um, that's a fun question, um, and that's you know, it, but carrying capacity changes. And I guess would be the the overall uh, story there with the number of um, the salmon escapement that we have each year. Um, so if it's a lower escapement, um, there's going to be more competition between bears. Um, so, but it may not be mean that, it's, that their, uh, the bear population is actually um, going to decrease because there may be abundant salmon somewhere else uh, a lot within Katmai or along the peninsula that bears can use that resource. Um, so, right now we don't know, but it, it seems that um, because survival hasn't has not changed uh, at least from the looks that we've had um, with the, the bear monitoring data of Brooks River. Um, that um, that the basically the river is is um, we're, we're not uh, we're changing its salmon salmon is um, not really impacting survival yet at this point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
floating by. We do have a bear friend floating by, adding his, um, his his water bubbles to our sound effects. Hopefully, y'all at home can hear that. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna sneak in a question on that one as well. You were mentioning about you know bears can obtain their resources on on these other areas of the park. There are so many places. Um, do we ever see bears travel from the Katmai Coast over here to Brook River, or like how far are these bears coming over? Do they ever, you know? Um, there's some studies, uh, which uh, one of the other biologists at Katmai has done and has looked at some of the, the genetics um, behind the, the bear population within Katmai. Um, so he would be a great person to talk to uh, about that specific question. Um, but I would say just in general that it, it does vary that, um, you know, for the most part, the bears of the coast don't need to cross over the mountain range to, um, to obtain the resources on this side of the river, but there are certainly capable of, of doing that. Um, yeah, as you were saying earlier, why would the bears leave here when they have all the resources, right? So probably the same for the bears over there too. <laughs> What other questions do we have out there? Leslie, what or who was your inspiration um, in becoming a park ranger? And were you always interested in bears? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I think it's just a, a, an appreciation for, for the outdoors and, and the, the natural world around me that um, my, both my parents um, they instilled in me. So, um, yeah, growing up and having them take me to parks and, and either, you know, picnics and, yeah, national parks and state parks, um, just really helped inspire me and, and was a, a place that I felt like I could, um, be happy and healthy. Um, so yeah. somewhere along the way, I, I got the idea to, to be a park ranger. Um, and, and yeah, I'm really appreciative of, the experiences that I've had both growing up and um, after being in the, the park service. Um, and I think it was the, uh, oh, yeah. where I was oh, in the park. Um, yeah. Not particularly. Oh, I guess like growing up, I mean, I, I <laughs> love bears. I just figured I would never have the opportunity to work with bears because they're, you know, the number of wildlife biologists positions researching bears is it's not it's not too high um, right. and i'm originally from michigan and so that number was even lower uh, of the number of, of bear biologists there um so yeah for me I, my my interests are are in, in general in popular wildlife populations and how they they fluctuate through time and, and it just ways to estimate um populations using count data not necessarily um that uh, wildlife that have been tagged or collared um so that's been it's been a, a great opportunity here at Katmai because we also have um, aerial surveys, both moose and caribou and, and ptarmigan. Um, so yeah, uh, it doesn't need to be bears, but um, in coming here to Katmai, um, wow, what an amazing experience. <laughs> and now, now I've you know, fallen in love with bears. So. Yeah, <laughs> you get the bears too. <laughs> I would I would have guessed it was originally um, ptarmigan based off you were talking about it earlier. <laughs> They're just a, you know a fun addition I had never thought of before, but now I get to I get to count ptarmigan. Yeah, <laughs> you get to count all of the animals. Alaska, what a great place to be a wildlife biologist yes. <laughs> to count things. To count wildlife. <laughs> I like counting things. <laughs> Let's see. All right. How can we get involved? And bear monitoring, our, our, our people want to get involved. Wow. Um, well, I, gosh, I would, I mean, it's, it is great having the support of the webcams, especially when we have bears that are either injured or that like, we don't know if they've showed up in, a uh, in several years. So when it's always great to hear, um, hear things of, oh, we did see that bear and here's a, here's a clip of that or, um, and yet, or just capturing unique behaviors that um, that are seen because there's there's really only one bear monitoring position, um, but so that person is only available to uh, you know for several hours each day. But the number of viewers that the webcam um, provides is is basically this great long term, every day, all the time look at, at what's going on at Brook River and, and bear activity. Um, so so for now, I would guess just say like we appreciate the help that is, is currently being offered and, and especially if 
uh, was communicating that, oh, we're kind of trying to look for, for this bear or um, in, in situations like that, um, that's usually the, the most helpful way of um, helping us, letting us know what, what, you, what everybody sees um, and not just uh, what the, the few rangers here are able to see. Absolutely. There are extensive records on um, the internet of viewers like you all out there, um, you know, seeing these bears and what they're doing and um, recording it for us. So mm -hmm. we're able to see these types of personalities come out with bears and the dispositions and, um, you know, just watch fun moments as well as the important moments. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like everybody out there, you've, you've been doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being part of the bear monitoring team with Zach and yes, with all of us here. Yeah. <laughs> so, well. Um, I think we're about at our end, but Leslie, this is so informational and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about bears. I'm sure there'll be more questions flooding in later, but we'll make sure to, you know, pull them your way. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll get the answer to more of your pressing questions out there. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been great. Yeah. <laughs> so this has been Leslie Scora, everybody, and I'm Ranger Kim Grossman. And thank you to everybody at Explore.org for helping make this happen. Um, and thank you for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. Never stop exploring.